Hi, once again, everybody. Welcome back in. I'm Ed Berliner. The Talk Sports Network kicks it off once again here. 2022, we're rocking with the free-for-all Florida, which means nothing is nothing is off the table. Everything's on the table. Everything's there. We talk about everything. We scream, we holler, we bitch, we moan. But more than that, we're smart at it, damn it. We're smarter than the rest. That's what I want to tell people from now on. They come to me and they say, why is your show different from anybody else? I say, you know why? I got smart people involved. People who know. We're not just these nickel and dime podcasters sitting out there, sitting in mama's basement, waiting for the new Star Wars or the new Battlestar Galactica movie to start. No, no, no. Also means that I've had way too much coffee today. So (laughs) way too much on this one. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start out from the south side of things or the southwest side of things, if you will. Uh, Joining us there, of course, when it comes down to uh, Bucks, Gators, Knowles, um, uh, let's see, Rays, Lightning, although I don't like to mention the Lightning, but that's another story altogether. I will because they're a great hockey team. Joey Johnston joins us there. He is from the south side of, not not the south side of Chicago, so just hang on, everybody. We'll get to that. Moving up the state then, George Diaz is here when it comes down to everything Orlando-oriented and the fact that this man has a real solid gripe today, which I love, which we're going to nail right on here. And he's taking his Christmas decorations down, which is even better, which means we're we're definitely cooking today. And from the north side of the state of Florida, the legendary Sam Kavaris joins us here. The man that Sam Khan, that Shad Khan needs to talk to every single day to find out how to run his football team. (laughs) What, What was that, showing us that there's no Christmas tree? That's correct. (laughs) <laughs> it's all right. It's, 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 I was it's, looking for my uh, I was looking for my golden this weekend. My golden is fifteen, which you know even my Clemson slash Maryland math can tell me that that's a hundred and five in human years. So he's hanging in there. Good. That's so because you've got the golden, and George, you want to celebrate that your puppy is back from uh, was at the University of Florida, correct? Yeah, he had 10 days of radiation treatment. It's got a skull tumor, not a good thing, but, you know, he's hanging tough. He's a good boy, and it's good to have him back uh, in the mix, and we're making the best of it. Outstanding. And, and Joey, I I don't even know if I've asked. Do you you have dogs? Don't have dogs at the moment. have two cats. So we're a cat household. He's a cat (laughs) person. Yeah, cats are extremely intelligent. How is this man... Fire him right on the spot. I knew that was coming. I I just, I figured that somebody was immediately going to say, what are we doing? We're talking sports guy talk and there's a cat person in the room. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to defend it. I love my cats. I love my cats. Two cats. He has two cats. But that's. Two black cats. But that's okay. If he were to come on the show and say, I have nine cats, then we got an issue. Yeah. (laughs) Then we're worried. It's a yeah. starter set, though. Two is a starter set. It, it is. That's uh, any day now. Any day now. It's rolling. Uh, All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get rolling because George Diaz is going to start things off here today, but we're going to go ahead and set the stage here. First of all, Ben Roethlisberger is deciding that he is going to hang it up. Well, at least as it stands right now, he's got another game to play. But there's a lot of issues about Ben Roethlisberger that people seem to be overlooking. And as a matter of fact, in the last, oh, few weeks, whatever, The national networks, ESPN, Fox Sports, of course, the National Football League has been raging about what a marvelous individual he is. God bless Ben Roethlisberger. Hall of Fame material. What a wonderful guy. Hold tight. Let's go back to April of 2010 from CBS News. This morning, new details from a Georgia police report on NFL star quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. A two-time Super Bowl winner learned this week he will not be charged with a crime, but he still faces a likely suspension. CBS News correspondent Elaine Quijano is here with more. Elaine, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Jeff. You know, the young woman who accused Ben Roethlisberger of sexual assault said she tried to get away from the Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback and made it clear she did not want to have sex with him. The 20-year-old college student alleges that Ben Roethlisberger invited her and her friends to the VIP room at this rural Georgia nightclub where he encouraged them to down numerous shots of alcohol. In newly released police documents, the accuser said one of Roethlisberger's bodyguards sat me on a stool. He left and Ben came back and exposed himself. I told him it wasn't okay. He followed me into the bathroom and shut the door. I still said, no, this is not okay, and he then had sex with me. Earlier this week, prosecutors decided not to file charges against Roethlisberger, saying... The sexual allegation against Mr. Roethlisberger cannot be proven 
beyond a reasonable doubt. Bright also revealed the woman asked him not to pursue the case because she said of the publicity. Still, the accuser could, if she wanted, file a civil suit. If she did that, the burden of proof would be lower. She would just have to prove her case by a preponderance of the evidence, which means she would have to show the jury that it was more likely than not that she was sexually assaulted. Thursday, officials from the Steelers said the team is ready to discipline Roethlisberger. There could also be league action against him. We've made it very clear to Ben that there will be consequences for his action. And Ben has indicated to us that he's willing to accept those consequences. The quarterback's troubles have also cost him a sponsor. The maker of Big Ben's beef jerky says Roethlisberger is falling short of the company's standards. Jeff. CBS's Elaine Kihano. Elaine, thank you very much. Of course, this is more than being about beef jerky, because here we have an individual whom, at least if you look back at his past, he has a checkered past. He was punished. The Steelers punished him, and Roethlisberger took his punishment. Now, he didn't do any jail time for this, of course. That was the beginning of everything. George, this comes down to what you have in your craw this week, and I think it's fair. There is a consistent manner of NFL and media whitewashing when it comes to certain people and when they become great or when they are made great. Roethlisberger may have been there a long time. He's won the Super Bowls. He's got Pittsburgh actually in the palm of his hand in many ways. But you got to tell the whole story here. That's one side. George, the other side says, wait just a minute. The guy didn't go to jail. He wasn't found guilty of anything. You guys are just bringing up stuff because you want to throw spit at, Bren, uh, at Ben Roethlisberger. So where do we go ahead and split that baby there, George? Well, I'm going to throw a little bit more spit because it's documented. There was a second allegation, too, and it didn't it ended up not going anywhere, if you will. But there was still in terms of a, a legal action that there was he was not found wrong. I don't think there were any uh, charges ever pressed, but there was an allegation as well. So, look, this isn't a, a jail walking <coughs> ticket. OK, these are two rape allegations and there definitely seem to be smoke. Now, whether he's cleaned up his act, he certainly seems to have cleaned up his act. He's a family man. But you can't have a body of work both on and off the field. And what happens time and time again, We I, I, the thing that got me going, Ed, by the way, was ESPN did a fawning piece. And guess who they asked for perspective? Ray Lewis. You want to Google Ray Lewis, Super Bowl, Atlanta, and murder and see what kind of stuff you get? You know, so... This is uh, this is where we're at. That that I get it. I get it that 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 people are not perfect, and I get it that people are going to focus on the positive. But geez, this is some serious stuff that you just can't ignore as part of the man's overall resume and legacy. Well, but so where do we go on this? Because you even just said it there at the end. Yes, everybody has feet of clay in one way or another, and just about everybody has some sort of background issue that's become involved that, that you can talk about. How long do we drag it up? And there are going to be people who will watch this and listen to it and say, what the hell are you dragging it up for? It's 11 years old and it's no big deal. I say that because- Life is we're, a big deal. Well, yeah, well, wait a minute. We're, we're talking about sexual assault. I get it. And yeah. it is a big deal. But there are people saying, guy didn't get arrested, said he was sorry. Where do we go from here? You know that that whitewash only goes so far. Oh yeah, and 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 it's this isn't going to go anywhere. But you'd at least like to provide. How about if you do do a piece and you provide what happened, and then you kind of fast forward and saying, look, you know, since this, he's overcome this, he's overcome that. He's a he's married now. He's a family man. He's everything's good. But but you but you provide all of the context, not just the the good stuff. Do you realize that? it? Wait a minute. You're, you're talking about balance here. <laughs> <laughs> which is going to be frightening. Oh. And Sam and I both know from the television perspective, when you're putting these things together, and especially from an ESPN standpoint, look, ESPN is in bed with the National Football League, Sam. That's their moneymaker right yeah. there. They're not going to come out and they're not going to go ahead and spit more about sexual allegations because it doesn't look good and doesn't <laughs> feed their wonderful, be happy, go ahead, put your heels together, click them, and everybody loves the NFL theory. Well, you know, Ed, uh, the... The leagues now use this term uh, as uh, media partners. I mean, right. ESPN is a media partner with the league. Um, the Golf Channel is a media partner with the PGA Tour. Uh, CBS is a media partner with the PGA Tour. So, you know, you're not going to get the perspective of 
a true news organization in in situation. And by the way, real quick, I want to send my condolences to Tim Rosefort's family and all the people who knew him. I, I knew Tim for 40 years. He's just a wonderful guy and um, succumbed to Alzheimer's at 66 this week. But and, and fair um, indeed. I knew I knew Tim when he was with the Palm Beach Post and we were covering the Miami yeah. Dolphins together. It's a it's it's a tragic yeah. case and we all I, I, I think we all do send our condolences to the Rosefort family yeah. indeed. Yeah, really good guy and never never wavered. And I remember uh, not to get off topic, but the last No, time, go 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 ahead. I, last time I was with Tim in person was here at the players and um there was a there was a mild controversy about something and they brought Tiger and uh, I think it was Henrik Stenson out, and uh, I was standing there and, and I asked a couple of point blank point blank questions and they all looked at me like, you know, really? And um, when everybody walked away, Tim turned to me and goes, "I guess I'm getting soft." <laughs> he goes, and I said, "Well, you work for these guys these days," but we had a good laugh about that. Anyway, I do think that when when you're looking at a uh, organization like ESPN who's doing a piece on Ben Roethlisberger. They're not going to bring up any of the controversy unless it's in a in a news format. And it's kind of like the way all news channels are these days, depending on no, no matter what news channel you're watching, you're going to get some shows that are real newscasts, some shows that give you a, a perspective, and then others that are just opinion shows. And that's that's ESPN certainly has become that. <coughs> that's why they they're not... You know, it's not like ESPN is out there breaking, you know, stories constantly. There is, uh, they've got insiders, they can give you updated information, but it's not like uh, you're going to see a hard-hitting piece these days about the NFL from one of the NFL's media. Yeah, well, that's that's the next thing, and I think it, I think that's fair, Joey. There's the the thing that Sam brings up about media partners, because it used to be that we would all work for outlets, and we were told to go cover a story and cover it fairly. But then, at least in my instance, and I'm sure this happened in Tampa, and it's happened to everybody, you've got newspapers, media outlets, television, radio, who start to make money with the franchise. They're helping the sponsor. They're marketing. They're part of the PR. And that means, and I had this said to me, Joey, I swear, when the news director came up to me and said, you got to go light on the Dolphins, Ed, because we're doing the preseason games, and everybody knows our salespeople got to make a buck. That was the first thing when I was doing the play-by-play -play for the Dolphins in the preseason, first moment that I realized what was actually going on. And we really don't know where to go anymore for a completely unbiased look other than right here because none of us are tied into those media outlets anymore so we can say it and not fear for our paychecks. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure this has happened in many markets. I, I still shake my head at the at the news anchors who wear the the jerseys and the and the of the home team it, it's that's a little too much uh but it still goes on uh they're pseudo cheerleaders for the home team who they uh, who they sponsor who they who they carry the games of um and we you know we see it in all kinds of ways you know the story that, that tom brady gives the local media here in tampa is often very different than than the ones he gives to uh, the networks or or to the insiders, uh, you get you get a different different version of something, a little more a little more insight. Um, well, but and, we all uh, know though, as reporters, and I and I wager now, and I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody, but the reporters know that when they go up and talk to Tom Brady, you better treat Tom nice, and you better not talk about anything yeah, that goes on at away, home right. or anything that right. happens negatively. Because Brady will screw you in, in, in the media interviews. Brady will then tell everybody else it becomes a cancer throughout the locker room. And you lose your job. You, you, you lose your chance to do your job if you don't kiss their ass. Yeah, and that happens everywhere is uh, huh. the, 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 one, the one honest question, the one question that needs to be asked is the one that, that, that kills the interview with, with the player. So, um, so, so you have a, a, a media core that gets intimidated or gets uh, shy about asking the question that needs to be asked. So, you know, you, you come up with a sanitized version of, of uh, presenting a, a player as opposed to reporting the news. And, and that's kind of where we are these days. So then uh, why should we even consider, George, I, I, Sam brings up the excellent point. We shouldn't consider ESPN to be fair in any way. Fox Sports won't be fair. CBS Sports won't be fair. 
I mean, if something happens that's a volcano-esque type of news story, they'll report it. But why should we expect that anybody who's in bed with these leagues will come back and tell anybody the truth or the facts? They won't. And then, George, on the other side of that, because they're not telling us the facts, then we go to all these bloggers and idiot knuckleheads sitting in their, their mama's basement creating podcasts who just go off and fly with absolute garbage because they're just guessing and they need clicks. There's really no place to go for the fact anymore. In other words, here we are, the four of us telling everybody else to get off our lawn is what essentially, you know, and, and, and I mean that it, I joke, but it's true. But I it's mean, true. Talk about, you made a very good point. We're not tethered to anybody right now, so we can say whatever the hell we want to. So there's no fear of that repercussion that we're going to get squeezed out of the media, uh, uh, the media availabilities, and, and, and our access will be cut off. But that's the world we live in. I, I will say this, though, in terms at least of the print media, uh, you have columnists that are certainly going out there and and doing their due diligence. In, Very few. In, in talk, talking about franchises, you know, we see it with the Dolphins. We saw it with a, you know, Greg Doyle and, and Bob Kravitz over in Indy with that implosion that made no sense uh, in, in Indianapolis and the playoff and, and blowing the playoff um, chance against uh, the Jaguars. So there, there are a lot of good, great journalists out there still fighting the good fight, but they're few and far between. These well, uh, that was kind of my point. I think there's guys, I think it's fewer and far between anymore. I mean, I can think of one, it just comes to mind right away here in South Florida, Dave Hyde. Dave Hyde's a friend and he's been doing this for a long time. Dave spits it out quietly, mm -hmm. factually, yep. and does not kiss anyone's ass and never has. He's flat out excellent at what he does. Exactly. But the problem with it is Dave and those like him who are very good get buried by the, and I hate to use the, the words, but it fits, the misinformation, disinformation side of the ass kissers who basically want to go out there and create podcasts and video casts and just be as outrageous as possible because it's going to get more clicks and that's what people fall for yes <clears throat> when have you seen a investigative piece about nascar oh right geez. i don't know if you guys covered nascar i yeah, cover nascar a lot long time is right here we, and, we actually I mean, I, i'll raise my hand though we did one and won quite a number of awards right before earnhardt died if you look at the Sentinel, we had a week-long series, and I was not a big part of it, but Ed Hinton was, but I, I was part of that. And we basically predicted that that was going to happen. So I do take it back. Huh. We did have it. It's been a while, but we did saying that this, their current situation was ripe for disaster, and you knew the icon of the sport was going to die the week after we published that series. Sam's, so, uh, Sam's point's well taken, though. But I digress. Though. You're right. But I, you know, no, it is. It is. I'll just... I just wanted to give a shout out to something that we did a while back. Which is great and is rare, as you know. But uh, having covered NASCAR since 1978, I, um, I saw, you know, I used to hang out with Earnhardt in his garage. I got to know him. I, I would actually say we were friends for, for quite a while. And, um, you know, just sit on, on the floor up against the wall and talk about what was going on, what was happening in the world. And and that kind of thing. So, of course, you know, I did have a mustache and I did wear gargoyles. So maybe that's why I like it. But, <laughs> anyway, but, Hands uh, up from everybody who had a bad 70s or 80s porn stash. Okay. <laughs> so, had? Okay. Um, the, you know, but the I don't have the pictures. Is, I wish I would have had them. Had you told me, I would have dragged up some old pictures and it would have been perfect. So I wasn't ready. <laughs> I, can, I can specifically remember... Um, being there and being one of maybe two TV stations who were there and just talking to drivers as they were walking around or whatever, there was no real organization. All of a sudden ESPN kind of discovered that and Benny Parsons started showing up at the track. And I, I realized a lot of the drivers weren't willing to talk to me and other journalists any longer because Ben Parsons was where all the information was gone because ESPN was doing a lot of positive things. Benny Parsons wasn't going to say anything negative about NASCAR. I mean, it's where his, his bread was buttered on a regular basis throughout his entire career. So, you know, that, that sport changed. And as George said, you know, they wrote, they wrote some, some things about it. And that actually happened. 
And then once the big money came into the sport, when NBC and Fox paid them a lot, of, a lot of money and kind of, you know, changed the dynamic of how the media dealt with that sport, the coverage of that sport became very different. And even these days, it's very fawning about about the drivers and who they are. And, you know, you don't know anything about who they are. Tell them, don't tell me they're all angels. All right. But you don't know anything about those guys because nobody is investing that time. They're all up there in Kannapolis outside of Charlotte, you know, remote places that are guarded. I mean, it just I, I just think that it's a it's an example. Not saying there's anything to matter with with NASCAR, but I do think there's an example. That's a good example of, of a sport that has just kind of existed in this vacuum of any sort of invest, investigative journalism. Well, there's a there's a fear factor. And again, I brought this up to employment because if you screw with the guys on the ground, they'll basically make you persona non grata in the locker room. But then there comes down to the reporters looking to do that who really can't anymore. The columnist George brought up who still have the ability to say something. And then we have what I like to call the, you know, the rock throwers. And this is what gets the attention. George, you brought this to my attention as well. This is uh, a column Drew Maggery has written for a lot of places and has a reputation of being perhaps a little off-center sometimes, let's say, uh, with, his, with the manner in which he writes columns. And he wrote this for SF Gate, which is the San Francisco Chronicle website. And this is the kind of thing that gets the attention, guys, when he calls Ben Roethlisberger a tactless, selfish, belligerent dickhead and goes into the whole rape allegations, the woman named Andrea McNulty coming forward, the boss threatening to fire her, the SI expose that talked about Big Ben harassing service workers, dining and dashing on multiple occasions, poor sportsmanship, crashed his motorcycle in 06 while not wearing a helmet, swore he'd always wear a helmet afterward, didn't, then flipped off journalists who caught him riding free and easy. This is the kind of commentary that makes an impact. And George, you even brought that to my attention. That's what grabs you. Now, Maggery, in many ways, is telling the truth. If you talk to people who know Roethlisberger, they will tell you the guy is a screaming dickhead. Well, guess what? How many of us... How many of us have walked into any locker room or any post-race interview or any post-match interview and not met our share of dickheads? I mean, they're, they're pretty much there. In Male, female makes no difference. So, George, why is it that a guy like Maggery gets attention? I mean, maybe we have to come out and use more, uh, more offensive language than ever before. Maybe we have to start out the show calling and now introducing America's sporting dickheads. That might <laughs> that might get big numbers, George. It would, but there, there's it goes back to what we're talking about. How many guys and women are willing to put themselves out there and say and, and and throw the rocks, as you like to say? There's not a lot of rock throwers left in our profession, and that's a sad thing. You gotta you want to mix it up. You can't have and let's face it. There's going to be guys that are just going to write hit jobs uh, and women too. I keep saying that to write hit jobs just to write hit jobs. And, and we all know there's a difference, but you might argue or might have a, an issue with the way that he presented the story, but he certainly makes valid points. And, and one quick aside here is that I also read in the postscript of all this, that the Washington post, I believe of the business editor, she tweeted out something just ripping ripping the column and she was uh she was reprimanded by the post uh, and the tweet came down because uh people it, it did not it did not age well in the in twitter verse so you have um you know there still are, are i i i still think there are enough people out there and and you know bless us we're not going to pat ourselves on the back but there's people that are just not going to put up with the bs and the sanitized version Give us everything you got, and then we'll make, you know, we'll make, we'll judge accordingly. I'll pat us on the back. I I, I, I don't mind, but it comes down to, <laughs> who was it who said it earlier? That's, I think you even said it, George. All right, four old white guys, get off my lawn, damn it. <laughs> That's all you guys. But the issue is, what we're discussing here is is the, the factual, our opinion based on our experience and unfortunately, 
because we're not throwing excrement against the wall at somebody or putting up pictures of them in, in strange positions, people don't want to pay attention. And that's why I think to many ways ESPN gets a pass every single time. They're seen as the expert because they're locked into the NFL. Can't change it. So yeah. let's I move mean, that. I don't know. Ben Go Roethlisberger, ahead. I've interviewed him a half dozen times, and uh, he's always been um, short and not forthcoming. But, you know, that's the way a lot of guys are when it comes to the media. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that's going to continue to exist in that organizations and individuals, Tiger Woods being the first, trying to only disseminate information from their own sources. Every NFL team has their own web uh, experts, has their own writer, has their yes. own TV. Every, you know, they're trying to push their information out the way that they want it managed. And as we all know, we organizations have tried that since the beginning of information. It doesn't work. You've got to have free and w without, you know, that old that old saying, there is no greater disinfectant than the hot white light of inspection. And that, you know, if you want to run an organization that people are going to consistently revere and and root for, then you've got then you've got to basically have open doors and and be a and be transparent. In many ways, though, hasn't the media and I hate to use that phrase sometimes, that, that word, but hasn't the media created these dickheads in many ways? Let, let's be honest here. There used to be a time when we would go into locker rooms, we'd talk to athletes, the athletes would talk to us, we'd go into press conferences, we'd talk to them. They knew who to trust. We asked them questions, but they weren't questions based with a gotcha on it. They had a little background to it. And then, you know, Joey, I'm sure that you as a print guy, you know this. You had off conversations. You stopped. There was the gaggle. Everybody got together. You had the conversation. You had the presser, if you will. And then you stopped and they talked to you. And they, because they, they trusted you. But when major organizations, and I think, I'm not sure whether it was the NFL or Major League Baseball that was the first to do this. When they started to let the nickel and dime podcasters in here who weren't with any real organization, but because they covered the team on a regular basis, they gave them access to it. And then we created podcast upon podcast upon podcast upon video upon blog upon all this back and forth the athletes themselves don't trust the press anymore because quite frankly the, it's it's earned it the the, the 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 press that's involved joey in many ways hasn't earned their respect so it's that facet that's helped to turn them into the the stone-faced get out of my face kind of uh, individuals that they are there still are some athletes who understand uh, experience, who understand perspective that that's given by by the people that have been there since the beginning. But but you're right, uh, the, the 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 media gaggle, uh, uh, if you want to call it that, at a, at, a, at an NFL team, is uh, is just blinding these days. And 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 these newer guys, newer athletes and coaches, they can't discern uh, what what's what. Uh, it it's a personal frustration of mine in, in this market that many athletes and people cannot tell the difference or don't want to tell the difference between Rick Stroud, who's covered the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for, for 30 plus years for the Tampa Bay Times and continues to break stories on that beat. They can't tell him any different than, than the blogger or the podcaster. They're just lumped as one, and that's not right. Um, you know, Rick Stroud, the information that Rick Stroud provides is far different than what a podcaster or a blogger or somebody who's just there along for the Proud ride. is brilliant. He, he's, he's serious. He's a serious yeah. journalist. Yeah, he's, a, he's, he's a serious <laughs> journalist, and he does investigate, and he pulls no punches. Yet, in the eyes of, 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 the, of the players and, and many fans these days, uh, he is just seen as one of the voices, not the voice. And I think that's, that's a problem. Because uh, his, his, if I read information from Rick Stroud, I'm going to view it completely differently than, than than a blogger or a podcaster. I know where he's come from. I know the work that he's put in, and I know that his sources are credible. I cannot say that for all the media, and I'm sure that that exists in every market these and days. That's uh, why. Now, that's why I put together this group because we've all been there. <laughs> do you, does anybody anybody else have daughters? Anybody else have daughters? Yeah. 
I have I have two daughters, right? Oh, and daughters. I thought you said I'm I, I swear to God, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you, you said, said dogs. I, <laughs> I thought he was gonna throw story. Joey under the bus. I, I thought he was gonna throw yeah. Joey under the cat bus again. No, I'm sorry. I, I no, have, I have I no have daughters. Two cats and a, and a son, so I'm I'm I i just can not fit into any okay. any uh any mold. You're two, the only I one have, with the daughters in. Okay. I have two I have two daughters and a son. Um and they're all wildly successful, smart, good looking, you know, brilliant people. Take after their mom. As a, as a, thank God, as, as Bill Murray said, lost in translation, if you're lucky, they grow up to be the most delightful people, you know, but which in my case is the, is the case. But having said that, uh, and having had a 43 year career, how if you had daughters and I'll tell you my number and I'll tell you their names, I've met four, four professional athletes that I would have introduced to my daughter. <clears throat> I mean, I've interviewed 20,000 guys. Four of them, I what was like after getting to know them. You know, this guy. What sport were they from? Okay. One from golf, uh, two from football, one from basketball. Interesting. See, and that comes down to the whole, that, that's another entire conversation. Out of all the athletes that I've met, if I had daughters, I can honestly say that it would be golf. I, absolutely, I would think about that. Hockey. Not all of them. No, no. no. No, hell no, but hockey, because a lot of the hockey players that I've gotten to know over a long career are very family oriented. I wouldn't introduce my daughters to a basketball player if you paid me. I wouldn't come close. But again, that's just sort of how you know we've all had different experiences, and we get to know different people and how they treat each other and how they're treated. But I think that's, I think it's how the the new media, if you will, in the last ten fifteen years treats the athletes that turns them into the assholes that they are in in many cases not all some of them quite frankly are born that way you know as maggery said even using the phrase dickhead some of them are just born that way and are that way but i think that this this gaggle of overdone media and everybody swears that they know i had lunch with this person i talked with this person i know this i saw one today and we're going to get right to this where there was an individual who said i talked to brian flores and brian flores told me how much he disliked tua and how much Tua didn't work for him, and how much Tua didn't do this. And I'm, I'm almost at the top of my lungs while I'm reading this. I'm screaming, absolute bullshit. I mean, you're telling me that a, that a coach just came out and told you all this? These coaches are smarter than this. So it's just people making stuff up as they go along because they want the clicks and they want the fame. Sorry, we did it. And we, and we did it as a profession, people. That's why I keep telling people we're smarter than the rest. And I'll stand on that every single time. I'll be happy. Hey, hey by the way, by the way, getting back to Sam's list, I'm willing to bet you that uh, that Jalen Ramsey is not one of the four. <laughs> <laughs> Just a wild correct. guess on my part. <laughs> wild guess. I wouldn't let Jalen Ramsey walk my dog, or dogs. It's another story altogether. So let's let's move that over then to what uh, to uh, again people who say things and and with the coaches that are involved here. We have got at least seven or eight NFL franchises right now that are complete, steaming, unadulterated dumpster fires. And we've got two of them right here in the state of Florida, the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Miami Dolphins, all over coaching changes and whether or not the owners know what's happening and whether or not the owners actually know. Hey, Sam, we come again. Let's go back to the lawn, if you will, from a, t a time when people who owned NFL franchises actually made friends with, contacted with, and got to know the people who knew the NFL and who were smart enough to know how things worked in the NFL to select their general managers, their personnel people, and their coaches. But when it comes down to a coaching search now, it just seems like it's quick, throw something against the wall and, and see who we can find that looks good for the moment. And not only that, Sam, when I talk about franchises like the Dolphins, the Jaguars, the Giants, the Jets, um, the Bears. Um, who the hell would want to work for these franchises is the big question. I'll tell you who. Guys who want that chance and want the big bucks to be part of the NFL fraternity. That's who. Sure. There's only 32 of those jobs, both general manager and, and head coach, and that's why, you know, guys are willing to take it. You know, here in Jacksonville, it's a very, very, very close-knit group uh, of one that is picking a coach, and that's the owner. And that's why you don't hear anything. There's, you know, there's all kinds of 
rumors out there. It's Byron Leftwich. It's Doug Peterson. It's, you know, it's Bill O'Brien, it, you know, whatever. None of that is based on anything but speculation because Shad keeps his own counsel and, and does not, does not uh, kind of work with anybody else. In fact, the last time they picked a coach, he took his boat to Miami, in fact, Ed, and parked it right there. You know, he has a 330-foot yacht called the Kismet 2, which has been in several movies. It's it's very impressive. I mean, I've, I've been on board several times. It's 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 like they took the Hyatt and laid it down in the river, basically. But it's <laughs> uh, but he instead of conducting the searches here in town, they flew everybody to Miami and then they brought them to the boat and that's where they wind and dine them and, and talk to them on a regular basis. So where they're doing it now is is hard to say. I mean, a lot of it's virtual virtual. Some of the guys they're talking to are in that window that the NFL has created for guys who are still in the playoffs. Um, you know, guys like Nathaniel Hackett, um, who who still are a part of an organization and still working. So uh, I, I do think that that if if I was advising Shad, I would say, listen, let's call Tony Dungy and see what he thinks. Let's call Bill Polian and think, see what see what he thinks. Let's call Jim Caldwell at 67 years old and say, hey, you know, where, where, where do you think this is? Do you want to be a, a head coach again? Do you want to be a part of an organization? I would talk to some of these people who have had success, who clearly are not, you know, the flavor of the month, so to speak. They're, they're, not, the, they're not the hot coach right now, but they, they have some perspective on what you want to do in your organization. Different organizations have different ideas. Some are like, I just need to score a million points. I don't care if we lose a million one to a million, but we got to score a million points. Others are Steelers, for instance. Um, you know, we just want to win games. That's all. So uh, if, if that was the counsel that I was going to give shot, it would be, listen, you know, let's talk to some people in the NFL. And the NFL also can create those resources for you to put you in contact with people who can give you some perspective as to what you – what you want in your organization, and then consequently, who can fill that bill. Well, it's, it, it brings up a good point, too, because, Joey, when it comes down to these coaching searches, we are then overwhelmed by, oh, it's this person. It's going to be the Bills assistant coach. Oh, Flores is going to go to the Dallas Cowboys or the Houston Texans, or he's going to go here. It's a constant flow of rumor that goes on here. Joey, I think that there are a lot of owners out there who buy that, who eat that up, who go, are we talking to this guy? Well, gee, maybe we should. The, the the blog says he's a great coach and he's a great offensive coordinator. I think more than ever, and certainly I think it's in a lot of places like the Giants and the Jets, they get completely overwhelmed by this and they fall for it. And that shows again that we got clowns in the way when it comes to basically running these franchises and right at the top, they're the ones who make it the dumpster fire. Well, we live in a world where we have some modern phenomenon such as winning the press conference such as what is social media saying, such as just which way is the wind blowing? What's, what's the, what's the, how's this trending? How's this feeling today? And that's, like you said, that's how some of these decisions are made is, uh, you know, which way the wind is blowing on that particular day or, or, or what the, what, what Twitter is saying, or, uh, how's this going to look as opposed to having a conviction and going with it and standing by your person that you believe in. Uh, that's the way uh, I would say most of the people are hired these days. Is is this going to is this going to wash? Is this going to look good? Or how's this going to play in, in 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 the public? And not enough people, uh, as Sam said, have educated opinions who are basing it on people who are experienced in the league, who know what it takes to get a winning franchise going. Uh, they're going with in a different direction, and and, and as we've seen. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't work, and so we have a one third of the league that that seems like they're on a borderline of disaster, as opposed to building something credible, something that's going to last. So, George, where where do we? I mean, when it comes down to these coaching searches, it's 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 a number of it's a lot of bad information. Sam pointed this out before we went on the air too. There's agents who throw out misinformation. There's bloggers who throw out misinformation. There's the point that I made where people are just throwing this out. I mean. We've almost gotten to a point where the National Football League has got to do a better job on who they hand a franchise over to. Give it to a multi-billionaire who doesn't know shit from Shinola, and guess what? The Shinola people are going to be very unhappy with that. And there's an old one I drew up from the old 
go ahead and grab the, the lawn days. But it's it, but it's true. You've got people running franchises. Even the Mara family right now has become clueless when it comes to running a franchise. And Stephen Ross, who I'll bet you never stole a freight train, but holy God, the, the, the decisions he's made there sitting in Miami, George, again, I, I know people want the job because it's an NFL job, but who the hell would want to put themselves into that absolute flaming disaster? And it's, well, he, he created this. Yeah. Well, it goes back. I mean, it all starts at the top and trickles down and sometimes in a very bad way. You know, Stephen Ross, real estate guy. Uh, there was a point, and I know that a lot of us might roll our eyes at stuff that Colin Coward said. But the other day, it struck me that he mentioned, hey, he's a real estate guy. He wants to move. He wants to make deals. He, he can't stand Pat. And, you know, there, there's a mindset here. You can be a very successful businessman and an absolutely crappy NFL owner. The two can coexist very, very clearly. And, and we see that time and time again. You know, Khan's another example of a highly successful businessman doesn't has a, has a very bad track record as an NFL owner. So that's the problem too. It's it starts at the top and who you hire. And if you hire people who aren't fit for the job or be, or if you hire ass kissers, you know, I mean that's the situation in Miami seems like a bit of that, right? That the GM won over over Flores and uh both of them should have been gone if that was the case, but not. So we see it we see it time and time again in different places. It starts with the owner. Is the owner gonna gonna basically just let the GM and the coach drive the bus or are they gonna tinker and get involved? Well, but isn't, but, but isn't there, isn't there a, 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 a kind of a split there? Because you do have some owners who are involved in every single facet of the organization. Jerry Jones comes to mind right away. But then you have others who hire the right people as general managers, as personnel people and as coaches, and they sort of step away and let them do the job because they know football when the owner doesn't know it. It would seem to me that that latter is the best way to do it. Hire the right people, walk away, and make me a winner. But that doesn't happen anymore because even the owners have egos right now. And despite the fact that they say, I don't want anybody talking about me, they sure seem to love the limelight. You know, I, lo- yeah, I like Jerry, I mean, Jerry Jones. Is in it. Go ahead, Sam. I was just going to say, I like Jerry Jones. And he's also, of course, the general manager there for, for his club. But I'm pretty sure the Jaguars have... The Jaguars have more playoff wins than the Cowboys in the last 20 years. <laughs> now, that, that, true. You know, so that, now that, that's kind of an interesting thing. But Jerry Jones, very popular owner among the other owners as well, does a lot of business with the other owners, you know, runs hospitality company and, and all kinds of stuff. They take advice from Jerry Jones. But, um, uh, you know, I, I just think that, that you know, you, you look at the perception of different owners and, and what they're trying to get done. And, you know, Jones changes coaches. It's not like he's uh, a Stan Pat guy for a while. But uh, it's not like they they have been a super successful franchise on the field, even though they are the most valuable franchise in the National Football League. And by the way, you know, mentioning about Dumpster Fire or as in Jacksonville, many people can call it a clown show. Uh, <laughs> I went to the game last Sunday against the Colts, and there were between forty five and 50,000 people there. I don't know what the official number that they put out was. But um, there might have been 150 people wearing a clown nose. I mean, very few. So it just goes to show you the power of social media in a small group that is constantly pounding away on something. You would have thought the whole stadium would have been full of people in red wigs, but it was not. that was not the case. If you looked for them, they were there, but it wasn't like they were this overriding kind of force. So again, social media is having... Sure. It gives you a, an altered perspective of what the reality may be. Social and media makes us think that everything is massive, problem. right? So, yeah. but so then let's let, let's get right to the crux of the issue here, Joey. I begin with you because we're Florida based, and that's what we focus on: the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Miami Dolphins. Which one is the bigger dumpster fire right now? Ooh. Boy, I'm going to say the Dolphins. Uh, <laughs> that that says much- a lot right there that you got to sit and think about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say the Dolphins because I'm just in, again I'm not an expert on 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 the Dolphins, but I'm in, I'm incredulous at what I what I appear to be seeing was a team that uh, uh, appeared to be 
finding a good path for itself and was on the right right direction and and now the head coach is fired so th- this I did not see that coming any way shape or form uh so I I'm I I stand back and and marvel at at the dysfunction of that at at where they go from here uh you you get a guy that's that's built something in two years you give him two years and you fire him um no three years so I'll I'll, I'll vote for the Dolphins okay George uh tough call I still think that the Dolphins despite the dysfunctionality in the front office and the coaching scenario, it's still going to be a lucrative job. Uh, Jacksonville, not so much. They've got a much tougher hill to climb to get back to respectability. The Dolphins are there. They're solid. They're a winning you know, team with a winning record. I, th- I say it's Jacksonville. There's a lot of stuff there that needs to get cleaned up. Which takes us to Jacksonville, Mr. Cavaris. Yeah, the Jaguars have, have a lot of things that they need to fix in their front office, in their coaching ranks on the field, even on the staff, they've got they've got some serious problems with the perception of what's going on there because of uh, what's happened in their um, public relations department and 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 as a just as an organization here in the in the city, you know, and I, I wonder some of it's been intimated and some of it has been very direct about the Dolphins that they're that firing Brian Flores, that race was involved there. Uh, somehow, I, I'm not. I, I don't know if that's one of those social media kind of perspectives. But you know, people are like, "Oh, at the time, you know, Joe Judge kept his job, Greg Rule kept his job, Lauren Brian Flores went eight and one in his last nine games and got fired." So, uh, I, you know, I don't know Brian Flores, but I do know that if you were a Dolphin fan this year, you you had a pretty good time for a while. If you were a Jaguar fan. You had a good time two days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't count the it London all. <laughs> win. The London win, by the way, was over the Dolphins. But, you know, it happened at 930 in the morning. And, it, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe fans were happy. So if it happened but, at 930 in the morning, it really didn't happen. <laughs> Bills came here and lost. And, by the way, that game that they, they flat out beat the Colts. I mean, they decided that Jonathan Taylor was not going to beat them. And if they were going to win, they're going to have to do it with Carson Wentz, and he couldn't do it. And so it just was a it was a good game plan, well executed. And Trevor Lawrence played his by far his best game of the year. I think he had better stats in his first half than he had in any other full game during the year. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree on the Jacksonville side of things. I think that the 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 uh, the upward trend. I mean, for the Jaguars, it's about a it's about an 89 degree angle right here for the mountain yeah. to climb. Yeah. You know, it's and f- for the Dolphins, I'll give them maybe about a 25 degree angle. They've, they've still got some some pretty good talent there, but both of them just made uh, some of the most uh, egregiously questionable uh, calls that I can possibly think of in a long time. Joey, let's get to college football now to go ahead and close things out here this week. The college football title game is finally over. Yay, the SEC. Yay, the SEC is the best conference in the world. Yay. God, please, it, it, enough of this right now. But this all comes down to the fact that are we looking at that sea change that's finally going to happen in college football where this is it. The conferences are all going to become their own leagues eventually. The NCAA doesn't even need to get involved as if they are right now, but everybody's going to create their own little fiefdoms and go at it from league versus league versus league. Well, they really are kind of there now, aren't they? To where that's the most important thing and and to where no one's in charge and, and it is a truly wild west that is going to wind up to be, geez, I mean, we're going to wind up having 16, 24 playoff teams eventually. It's got to get there. You know, uh, uh, last week, uh, here we are uh, confronted with a with an Alabama-Georgia title game, a game that we've seen before, two SEC, SEC teams playing each other. And I legitimately thought to myself, oh, my gosh, do I, do I need to watch this again? I, I was not excited about it. Uh, by any stretch. Turned out to be a, a really good game. I did watch it, uh, so uh, we had a nice conclusion. But earlier in that day, uh, as the conference commissioners gathered to talk about the future of the playoff, uh, which has, has been proposed to be expanded to up to uh, as many as 12 teams, which would open it up for the, for the entire country, well, 
here they are two, two, three years into this discussion, they still cannot make any progress. What you've got is, as you said, as you suggested, several conferences all in their own little fiefdoms who are doing what is best for them and no one is working together. So I do not know where this is going to go. I had great hope for a 12 team playoff where each conference could be represented. Uh, the, the, the smaller conferences could have a seat at the table. You may yet end up with an Alabama Georgia game, but that's not the point. The point is to open it to everyone. So they all have an opportunity to get into the show. So I don't know where this is going to go now. Uh, the SEC may at some point be its own entity. Uh, I don't know what, what happens to the rest of the major conferences. They can't seem to agree on anything. Uh, some want four teams, some want eight teams, some want 12 teams. But I guess the point is, in three years later, we've gotten no closer to resolving this, and there's no promise of it. So uh, it just points out, again, that college football is fragmented beyond belief. We also have the transfer portal, we have the NIL, we have different rules for different conferences and different teams. And as popular as college football is, there is such a backdrop of chaos to it that I, I just wonder where it's all going to go. Maybe it'll make, hey, I don't know, maybe it'll make things better. I don't know, Sam. Everybody wants to, everybody wants big playoffs. Maybe in, in the end, you'll create those conferences. They'll become their own leagues. They'll figure it all out. Of course, we've already decided that the second and third tier college football programs are basically going to have to wander in the desert for the rest of their lives and, and take whatever pennies are left over from everybody else. But gee, maybe it'll work out best for everybody. La, la, la. I don't know. It, it seems yeah, like we're Georgia, heading that way. Georgia exposed Michigan. Alabama exposed Cincinnati. So for the two of them to play in the national championship game, they certainly seem to be the two best teams throughout the year and continued to do that into, into a two game playoff. 21 of the last 24 national champions, if you include Texas, have come from the Southeast. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big number. I mean, you know, you start talking about, you know, uh, in the last quarter of a century that, that that's where college football has become the central focus of a lot of athletes. You know why Alabama beat Cincinnati? Because there's not one player on Cincinnati that Alabama recruited. How do you know that? Because if Alabama recruited them, they'd have gone there. So <laughs> they, you know, they they, they were at Cincinnati. They're just they were a better, better athletes, a better football team. I've always been a proponent of a conference. I still think that that is a potential that may happen where they get 64 teams and every game counts. But that certainly seems to be the way we're headed. But the fact that 21 of the last 24, I mean, you don't see Rutgers winning the national championship. You know, uh, Oregon occasionally, you know, sticks their head up and is competitive on the national basis. Southern Cal has kind of fallen by the wayside. You know, where, where are those teams that are going to be competitive against the top teams going to come from? And at this point, outside of the South, it's not. It's just not happening. Well, that just brings up a great point then, because if the SEC is the best conference in college football that everybody seems to universally agree, how do you overcome that? I mean, you've mentioned all these different schools. So if that's the place to go, what are the Michigans, the USC's, the, the Denver's, the, the, the Texas A&M's, what are they not doing and how do they break this? Well, here, okay, here's, here's a difference that, between college and the NFL. Okay, if you're the you're the Jaguars or the Bears or somebody that's that's not on top of their game now. Um, how do you get better? Uh, you build an organization, you get a coach, you get a general manager, uh, people that know what they're doing, but you also get a high draft pick. So you have a chance at the best player in the draft each year. You have a chance. You may blow it, but you have a chance. So at least in theory, there's a way to level the, the, the competitive edge or the competitive balance out. With, with players if you make the correct selections. But in, in, in college football, um, not, not so much. You don't have a draft. Uh, you have uh, television money going, going by the gallons to the SEC and, and, and to a lesser extent to some of the lower conferences. But um, if you're Alabama, you have the best TV money, you have the best infrastructure, uh, you have the greatest resources. Uh, you have NIL deals better than anybody else. Uh, how, how do you blow that? 
how do you how do you not be the best in, in the country? You have everything. Every well, that's just the, the point. How, how do you do that then? If you're the if you're the USC's and and the the Rutgers of the world, as Sam mentioned, how do you get through that? Or is that just completely impossible? As long as they just keep rolling the way it is, there's got to be a way. Not impossible. Not impossible. But you've got to make absolutely the right selections of players. You've got to build it up. And now you have the threat. Now though, if you have one of these players and you have a great freshman season, they could leave. So uh, the stability factor is 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 eroding, but uh, but but my point is 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 the difference between college and and and, and the pro is you have uh, you don't have a system where you you have an equitable draft uh, situation. You don't have a situation where there's one person in charge who is at least in theory looking out for the betterment of the either of the entire league. Um, it looks to me like college football is is certainly, and it's been this way, but it's certainly moving forward in the future is going to be a huge case of the haves and the have-nots. And the, and the gulf between the haves and the have-nots is going to widen and widen and widen until it's into infinity. At least that's my take on it. Well, uh, it, so, so, George, I'll get you as the last word on this, and anybody can jump at any time here. But Sam's right. South, South runs it. SEC runs it. I think we're all right that it's all going to change. The NCAA has nothing to say anymore. It's all going to become conference-driven. So I, I guess at this point, I'm going to say, what's the big deal? Sure, you, you want to have 16 in a playoff? Go for it. W- why not? Maybe it makes college football better. Maybe it gives the, the Cincinnati's of the world and other schools a chance to actually rise for a change. And just instead of being relegated down to that second tier, seems like it might be a good idea. Sponsors will go for it. Sure, let's let's do it. I mean, we're we're throw now we're looking at like Joey said and Sam, they make good points. We're throwing darts now. If you're one of those schools, if you're a, a Cincinnati a few years back here, uh Central Florida made that great run. You're gonna get those uh, BYU a few years back before that. You're gonna get these quote unquote Cinderella teams now and then. But those are gonna be few and far between. And the big boys are gonna go, you know, they're gonna eat. And they're going to eat very frequently, and they're going to be at the head of the table. So um, it's kind of one of those fact of life things. We we often talk about sports things running in cycles. This isn't a cycle. This is a trend, and it's very much trending that the behemoths are going to rule the world, and that's not going to change soon. There's no uh, you know, if you have if you finish last in the SEC, you're not going to get a first round draft pick out of high school. You're going to have to go recruit the best players, and it's not going to happen when Alabama is sitting there knocking on your door saying, please come play with us. So, then so it, we are where we're at. But then that does that not just take us back to where we were? Let's go back to the future, where you're going to have the big conferences. We'll have the big championship. You will have a Division II, a second-tier championship. You will have a Division III, third-tier championship. You'll have two, three, four championships, and that's it. You're, you're going to have to learn to play that game because there's. we used to have those, but the wall is up right now. You're, you're never going to. Those lower schools will absolutely never break the wall to get the big money, and they'll never be able to compete against these big schools, own it, and just live in your own little world. But they have to get the memo. They haven't gotten the memo yet, Ed. You see the UCFs of the world still fighting out there, wanting to be part of the big boy mix. They're good. They're damn good. But there's a certain there's a ceiling there. And I know they beat Florida, but that was Florida looked like, you know, that team was crap by the time they played them. But so, you know, you know, it's going to be a situation and where, as we talked about, there's the top tier and then there's everybody else. So why not everybody just sit down at the table and accept the reality and accept who you are and not try to be somebody else? And get your ass kicked. Which will it never happen. To, and it comes down to the money that schools are willing to commit. And if we're talking only about football, to their football program. Where is it where, where is it important? At Alabama, it's important to everybody in the state, every alumni, that they have a good football team. You know, it wasn't at Florida for a long time. And then it was. And, and they're hoping to get back to that. It is at LSU. You would think it is at Southern Cal. You would think now it is at Oregon. There's a company that makes a, an AI for quarterbacks who walk into a room, or maybe they put a thing on now, and it simulates what the opposing defense is going to do in this darkened room. 
at the time, this is about three years ago, that that system cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is Alabama going to buy that? Absolutely. Is UCF, George? Maybe not. You know, I mean, are they not? So all of a sudden there's a competitive disadvantage because if they play Alabama, their quarterback is going to have seen everything they do on defense every day, all week long. And I mean, that that's the difference. Is Maryland going to spend that, my alma mater? Probably well, not. I, I, I think Sam makes tomorrow. a good point uh, because he's right. To the economy, to the state, to the prestige, to the players, to the athletes, it's big that Florida, Florida State, and Miami succeed every single year. Is it the same way for FIU, FAU, UCF, USF, Bethune-Cookman? No, it's not. And we're not trying to cast aspersions or tell anybody we don't like you guys and you gals. But when it comes to football, it's not important to the overall picture of the state. Oh, geez, I, we're going to get hammered on this one, guys. You know that. There's going to be people coming out of the woodwork here from these schools who are going to say, you need to give us a chance. We're trying hard. Yeah, you're trying hard. We get that. But you can only reach so much of a ceiling, yes? An alumni has it's to an be arms race. To, to contribute. And yeah, like George said, it's an arms race. And a lot of it comes down to alumni. I mean, the University of Florida is run by the UAA. They're, I mean, the the athletic department, which is which is not really part of the university, it's 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 dependent on a lot of contributions from bull gators and and people. You know, same thing with the uh, with the Seminoles. Same thing with Miami. I mean, their their athletic programs, uh, while they get money from the universities, are much dependent on the contributions of the alumni who want their programs to win. So, is that what we have to say? to the FAUs, FIUs, to all those other schools that I mentioned here. You want to be a big player? You want to get in there? Your alumni has got to get involved. You've got to get the high-dollar sponsors here. They've got to come in and give you millions of dollars. Not a, not 500000 here and there, not 25000 here and there. Once you get those big donors, you can play on the big field. Otherwise, sorry, you can't do it. That's simple, yes? That's exactly what it is. I mean, uh, you know, if you're, if you're willing to spend a half million dollars on a uh, quarterback system that where he has uh, the experience of seeing the opposing defense for an hour every day by himself in a room, then you're ready to play with the, with the, uh, with the big. Yep. Big but program. Joey, do you see those schools? I, and again, I'm not casting aspersions on these people. There a lot of them are my friends. I don't see big boosters at USF, UCF, FIU, FAU. All this. I don't see them stepping up to that kind of money. Do you? Probably not, but uh, it, as George said, it is an arms race, maybe to a lower degree. But it, everybody's fighting their own their, their own arms race. And this, in this state, UCF has been accepted into the Big Twelve. That's a big deal because their television money will go up a lot. USF aspires to that as well. Uh, that makes a huge difference, not only in the the facilities that you can build, but also uh, the staffing that you may have. For example. Uh, UCF or USF may have uh, three graphic artists doing uh, work on recruiting for their social media. At Tennessee, they probably have 12. And that's just because they have more money. They have more money to spend on not the high profile things such as the coaches and, and, and the facilities, but everything involved in the infrastructure. And at some point, there's probably going to be a, a, a line drawn where you're playing big, big boy football or you're playing another version well, but but that uh, sort of co comes to my point it's not here, realistic though. for everybody to do this are they going to win a big 12 championship no they won't is it not more important to step back and become the king in a smaller fiefdom than it is to get buried and basically be washed away in the larger fiefdom if you're going to get the, the sponsors bottom, get the sponsors to yeah. give you money and take that money and make a solid Division II type program, win championships there instead of consistently wallowing at the bottom and trying to and trying to delude yourself that you're going to win a Big 12 championship one day. Whether, whether it's delusion or not, once you've gotten a taste of the big time, you're going to keep chasing it. You're going to get in that arms race, and maybe ultimately you'll be proven to that was a bad decision. But uh, UCF uh, has has been accepted into the quote big time. USF would love. For that to happen, as would many others, because they're chasing that money. Without the money, 
uh, you can't survive in the big time. So it's like uh, it's like a musical chairs, and everybody's fighting to get in that last chair. I still think it's better to go back and be a be a title be a title holder somewhere. I guess I'm. May, you might be proven right in time because I think I think at some point we will see we will see people giving up the ghost and be, being more realistic. But right now everybody is angling for a spot at the table. Uh, if you're uh, if you're at a certain level of school, you are chasing a spot in a big conference until we have a clear delineation uh, between big and small. Everybody's going to be trying to get in there. And we got to do this. Is. We got to do this for a whole show one day because this in itself has got some great things to do. However, I got some kids on my lawn. I have to get off my lawn right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to get a hold of Joey Johnston, Facebook at Joey Johnston 372, Twitter and Instagram, Joey Johnston 813. Sam Cavares, get a hold of him at, at Sam Cavares, Facebook and Twitter. Instagram is at Sam Cavares Jr. And on the web, go to samsportsline.com. And for George Diaz, Facebook and Instagram, George Diaz 758, and Twitter at George Diaz. Gentlemen, we made a lot of enemies again today. <laughs> it's, it's the way the good show always goes. If you, if you anger somebody, that's a great way to do things. Great to see all of you guys again, still continuing to 2022. Best damn show on the internet, as far as I'm concerned. Why? Because we know things. We're kind of like, I'm, I'm trying to go back to the, um, I can't think of the character, Game of Thrones. Um, the little guy, uh, I'll get in trouble for saying that too, who said, uh, whose, whose main line was, I drink and I know things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that on a t-shirt once. Exactly what it is. We talk and we know things. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Don't forget, get a hold of everybody and get a hold of us. Go to Facebook and Twitter at Berliner Speaks. Also see all of our programs at TalkSportsNetwork.com. For Sam, for Joey, for George, everybody here, I'm Ed Berliner. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Rock on, true believers. See ya!